trusting God, you do not thank you.
There's a grace and the heart is on the fire Another way when the walls are closing me And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and the strength of me I know I will never be alone There was another
guys right now to remember the times that you felt like you were just being beat up by this world just to try to we don't want to try to bring up too many bad memories but to remind yourself that every single time that you were in something that felt like a trial or very fiery moment in your life that God was there and he is always there and I know that we say that a lot and sometimes it can just become mundane or repetitive but I just want you guys to sing that when we sing that even if he doesn't that we will praise him that we know that he's done so much already that if it was just from this day forward that he didn't do any miracles in our life that he's already saved us he's already died for us on that cross he loves us he's for us so I just encourage you to just remind yourself and I just pray for the Holy Spirit to just speak to you reveal himself to you that he was always there for you even in the darkest moment in your life that he was there for you and that even better he's there for you even right now whatever trial you're going through and that he's going to be there for you no matter what but I just encourage you to just call on his name and to just know that you know what God even if you don't answer the prayers that I want the way that I want it God I know that your plans for me are better that your ways are better than my ways God that we just want to give you all of our dreams and desires, God. We just want to lay them at your feet. Any desire that I have had, God, that has been for myself, God, for selfish gain, for pride, to make myself known, God, I just want to lay it at your feet right now. So I just encourage you guys, if any of you guys are feeling like so weighed down by this world and you have so many cares and so many burdens, and that's basically all of us, I just encourage you to just come here and lay it down at the altar just bow down and say god i just give you my all god i don't care this world's gonna tell me that oh who's your god he's not answering your prayers or say nope i know that he is good he's always there for me that he's gonna get me through this and even if he does it i'm gonna be in him with him in heaven and that's the best the greatest thing that we can have amen
believe it, just sing it out.
Amen. 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 Let's give them a clap. Good, good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. Doing good? Well, it's good to be back. I've been uh, out of the pulpit for two weeks, so this could be a long one. I just want to warn you. I'm just, just kidding. Just kidding. Hopefully we did good. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Revelation chapter 9, verse 7. And like Kevin said, I just want to say this real quick. We do our very, very, very best to protect you guys because, as I said, you know, we've had some crazy stuff. When I first came in here, someone threatened my life. And I've had that a few times, you know what I mean? And so uh, we, we take it serious. And uh, just pray how many know, as, as Kevin was trying to say, uh, unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman watches in vain. How many know? Um, we thank God for our law enforcement. We thank God for our security team. But how many know things happen? Uh, one of the uh, head sheriff people used to come here, and this guy who had a problem with me snuck right by him. And I said, I gave him a hard time saying, I wonder how drugs get through our board. I don't know how. No, I'm just kidding. I messed with him a little bit. But how many know God's the real protector? Amen. Amen. I love what one person said, uh, trust God and lock up your camels. We trust God first, but then we do our best. But really, we want to trust first and foremost in the Lord. Amen. So don't be afraid. Amen. I, I love this verse. I was thinking today of Revelation 12 that says that they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb. And it says they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. You know, I mean, they, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. How many know we should be not afraid of death. Amen. We shouldn't try to speed it up, but we shouldn't be afraid of it because we, if we're in Christ and we're living right, we will not die one minute before God Amen. wants to take us home or it's time to come home. Amen? Today's message is, I will restore to you what the devil has stolen. How many know that's a good thing? Amen. How, many, how, many, how many could use that right there? Amen. To restore to you what the devil has stolen. How many know the devil's real? And his job, as we're going to see, is to what? John 10.10, 10, to steal, kill, and destroy. He does not like you. Amen? I mean, anyone who's a Satanist, they, he acts nice at the beginning, but at the end he wants to what? Only steal, kill, and destroy you. Well, the first four trumpets, we saw the, uh, the trump, the, we've been in the trumpet judgments, dealt with the arena of the natural. The last three trumpets will deal with, as we saw, the supernatural, specifically demonic activity as we saw a couple of weeks ago. These demons who are the very worst of the worst of demons, those who have already been put in the bottomless pit. There's demons that are, that are running around and doing things, but there's also demons that were so bad that Jesus bound them in the bottomless pit or the abuso. And these demons that we're going to see today are going to be released. How I many of that's scary time for the world? It's already scary now. Can you imagine the very worst of demons being released? from the bottomless pit, and they are now going to be released to torment people in the tribulation period for five months. How many know this, that if you're in Christ, you have no fear of that? Amen? Because you are not going through the tribulation period. You're going to be raptured before, before the tribulation period. Now hear this, that means for those who are in Christ. And if you put it off and, the, and Jesus comes back, how many know you can be, as the movie said, left behind? How many do not want to be left behind for the very worst of the worst demons coming on the earth? It's already bad. I always love people. Some people say, some people that are called all millennials believe we're in the thousand year reign of Christ. And I always think that's funny because if we're in the thousand year reign of Christ, that means Satan's bound. And if Satan's bound, I want my money back. Amen? Okay? Because, I mean, if Satan's bound, wow, I can't imagine if he's loose. Okay? So he is definitely loose. But, but it's even going to be worse than it is now. Way worse. Okay? And so they're going to sting, these, these demons are going to sting people like scorpions to the point that these people hear this, as we saw a couple weeks ago, they're going to seek death, but death will flee from them. It's, that's where I believe movies get, de- uh, get zombies from, because these people will seek death. They'll want to die. They could even shoot themselves, but death will flee from them. How many know that's crazy? Yeah. Now, as you know, what would the world say? Now, why would a loving God do that? How could he do that? Well, how could he allow people to be tormented and for death to flee from them? Here's why. That they will have time and be motivated to repent and turn to God. Amen? Amen. Nothing gets your attention like sickness, as I know a couple months ago. When you're facing death, nothing gets your attention. When you're facing pain, nothing gets your attention. 
It's easy to ignore God, but once you have pain, what's it? Oh, Lord, 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 I love you, God, help me, right? And so God is doing this, not hear this. The Bible says he takes no delight in the punishment of the wicked. The only reason he allows this pain is to get people who rejected Christ at this time that are now going through the tribulation period to give their hearts to him. Do you hear that? He doesn't go, <laughs> I'm going to get them. No, it's to get people to repent and come to know Jesus. So you hear that? Don't let the world tell you how evil your Jesus is because your Jesus is not evil. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to die in our place when we didn't even care. How many, how many of you like me? I didn't care. I'd see that cross. Who cares? But I am so glad he died for me when I didn't care. And now I really care because I can't believe he loved me when I didn't care. Amen? Well, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. I ask humbly right now that you would just fill me with your Holy Spirit. Empower me to speak your words. That I would say everything you want me to say with the boldness you would say it. And I would not say anything more than you want me to say. I pray also for everyone here in this sanctuary, in the foyer, uh, that would hear on the radio or would hear on the internet. I ask, oh God, that you would now anoint their hearts and anoint their minds and anoint their ears. Let their hearts be good ground that when the seed of your word is planted in their heart, it will produce a harvest of 30, 60, and 100 fold. I pray for a 100 fold harvest. I pray that people would not just hear your word, but they would be effectual doers. That when your word exhorts them to do something, that they would do it. And when your word says to not do something, they would obey and say, Lord, I will by your strength not do it. Lord, help us to hear as you said, Jesus, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say? I believe, Jesus, for us to be truly saved. We need to make you Savior, but we also need to make you Lord. Because as one pastor said it so well, you gave your life freely for us. Now in love, you ask us to freely give our lives to you. So Father, we do that. Can you just say that? Just lift your hand and say, Lord, we give you our lives. We give you our lives afresh, Lord. Speak to us. Speak to your people. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone agreed, said aloud, Amen. 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 Verse 7 of Revelation 9. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold. Their faces were like the faces of a man, of men. Verse 8, they had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. Verse 9, and they had breastplates like bre breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots, with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings, in their tails. Their power was to hurt men for five months. And if you know anything about locusts, locusts live five months. So this is kind of a like kind of wild, but five months. Even this description is bizarre and hor horrific as it is about these demons, would remind John's congregation of God's promise in Joel 2. You don't have to turn there, but if you want to study later, there's a real wild parallel between Joel 2 and this chapter of Revelation 9. And you'll see, and there's a parallel. But the Joel 2, we find an amazing parallel of Revelation 9. Historically, the prophecy of Joel 2 was fulfilled in Joel's day. When Israel was besieged, hear this, by literal locusts. And remember, in the Old Testament, locusts always speaks of what? God's judgment. Literally, the prophecy was fulfilled in 72 B.C. when the Assyrians also marched south and carried off the ten northern tribes of Israel into captivity. But prophetically, the locusts in Joel also speak of demons. Demons that will be released from the Obuso or the bottomless pit of Revelation 9.1 as we saw a couple weeks ago. Now, nestled among the awful warnings of this terrible invasion is a wonderful promise. And let me paraphrase it for those you can read it later. But Joel 2 says, if my priests will humble themselves and pray, if they'll cry out, if they'll intercede, then I'll stop this judgment. How many know we need to do that? If my people call my name, but humble themselves and pray, we need to do that. Because we, a lot of us just sit back and go, man, it's terrible. Lord, rapture us. But how many know we need to also be praying for the Lord to return, but we also need to be praying, Lord, bring a revival. Here's what I say to God. Either come back quickly 
or bring one last great revival before you come. Amen? Amen? Because this kind of in-between is just kind of <laughs> a drag, you know? It's kind of like, eh, eh. But just either come back or revive us. Amen? I mean, that's a good prayer. Will you pray that prayer with me? Pray that prayer. But here he is. He says, if these priests will intercede, if the people will intercede and pray, then this terrible, there's a wonderful promise. Here it is in Joel 2, 25 through 26. And this is after all this judgment has come upon them. The Lord says, I will give back to you back what you lost to the stripping locusts. How many have felt that in their lives? And the cutting locusts, and the swarming locusts, and the hopping locusts. It was I who sent the great destroying army against you. Hear that? God sent this. And again, why did God send it? To wake his people up. Amen? He didn't send them to wipe them out completely. He sent it to wake them up to turn to him. Verse 26. Once again, you have, have all the food you want, and you will praise the Lord your God who does these miracles for you. Never again will my people be disgraced like this. I mean, that's a great promise. So God always gets our attention, then we repent, and then he what? He wants to bless us. Amen? How many, how many are convinced now that when Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing? But isn't it amazing when things go good, then we say, hey, I'm going to try to do this without Jesus. Now, we don't say that, but that's what we do. And the God has to bring some hardship, some pain, some financial struggle, and then what happens? We come back to him. Wouldn't it be just smart if we stayed with him, even in the good and bad? Wouldn't it just be good? <laughs> you know, it's so good. We all need God in the hard times. Wouldn't it be good to seek God in the good times? Just say, you're so good, I just want to seek you more. Not, oh, God, I'm getting up, but he bring a hardship. No, that we would just be wise people that would say, I want to seek you even in the good times. Amen? Guys, whenever we obey Scripture, when we listen to the trumpet of God, and remember these trumpets are warnings to the people, the trumpet of God, and repent and seek the Lord in sincerity of heart, then the Lord not only forgives us, hear this, he not only forgives us, but he makes up to us what was lost because of our sin. Isn't that good? Isn't God good? You think, just, you know, that, that I don't know about you, but just amazing. I would have thought that just being forgiven was enough, but God tells us that, no, I'm going to do more than that. I'm going to restore to you what the locust of sin has stolen and eaten out of your life. How many can say amen to that? God is good. Amen? God is good. Now, some of you might be saying, well, Craig, I'm 50. You know, that used to be old to me. Now I'm 57. It's not that old. 50, 60, maybe 70, maybe 80 years old. And you might be saying, but Pastor Craig, I'm old, and the locusts of sin have eaten a big chunk of my life away. You might be feeling there's nothing you can do. But I want to tell you, there is something you can do. And what it is, is this is the good news for you today, that whenever you choose to humble yourself, no matter how old you are, if you call on the Lord with humble heart of repentance, then he, the great redeemer, will not only forgive you, but he'll buy back the wasted years. You know what your redeemer means? It means to buy back, like buy out of slavery. He, cannot just, he doesn't just forgive us, but he also buys back what was lost because of our sin and failure to follow him. How many say that's a great God? Amen. You guys awake? Amen. God's good. Verse 11, and they had as a king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew is Abaddon, but in the Greek he is Apollyon. And they had, here they said, a king over them and the angel of the bottomless pit. This is another indication that these creatures are not literal. Some people say that these are literal locusts. Now, I don't know about you, locusts are bad, but I wouldn't be so afraid of locusts, right? We have we have pesticides, right? You know, they didn't have that back then. I wouldn't be so afraid. But these are not, I believe, literal, literal locusts. But because the Bible tells us that the literal locusts have no king. But these locusts do, right? It says in Proverbs 30, verse 27, that locusts have no king, yet they all advance in ranks. So this locust has king. So we know this is not a real locust. But it's a metaphor. Both names here mean destroyer. No matter what language or culture, the devil always does the same thing. He comes to what? John 10.10, 10, to steal, to kill, and destroy. 
You need to get that down, amen? You need to know that. The, the devil never, you know what I mean? When I was in the world, boy, how many know Satan made the world look so good? But then once I partied, once I, you know, I never, I never forget the old song. Does anyone remember Boss Gags? Remember that song, Bring the Check Around? As soon as that bar tab would come around, all of a sudden a $450 bar tab back in 1980, that was a lot of money. It's a lot of money now, but it was a lot of money back then. And I remember just going, my goodness, sin costs a lot. You know? But the devil makes it look so good, you know? And then the Lord would just show me stuff, you know what I mean? Show me stuff that I won't go into because some of you freak out of it. But the Lord showed me that. I used to think the world was so nice, but, you know, how many know the devil? And some of you young Christians, the devil tries to remind you of the good old days. But how many know it wasn't that good? If it was that good, you'd still be in the world, amen? It wasn't that good, okay? Don't let him lie to you about how good it was because for everything you say is good, I can show you a million things bad. Verse 12, one who is past, I'm sorry, one woe is past. Behold, still two more woes. Remember when the angel said, whoa, whoa, whoa. When the angel says, whoa, he isn't going, whoa, what's up? He's saying, whoa, <laughs> trouble, whoa, watch out, whoa. Woes are coming after these things. Verse 13, then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns, hear that, the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. That's the, that's the, uh, the throne of God, before the altar of God. Verse 14, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. According to Joel 2, as I said earlier, the priests were to lead the people in repentance. They were to lead the people in repentance. And we see the same thing happening in heaven here. Who is the priest at the altar of intercession in verse 13 here? It speaks, it speaks to the sixth angel who then orchestrates the judgment of the tribulation is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Now hear that. Jesus is interceding. He's not, like I said, going, <laughs> I'm going to get you. He is interceding that people would come to know the Lord, come to know him in this hard time. Amen? So God doesn't, as I said, he takes no delight in the punishment of the wicked. He is just doing this to wake people up. And remember this too. I want to tell you this. Revelation is not meant to scare you. It's not meant for you. A lot of people say, I'm so terrified of Revelation. Pastors, I'm so afraid to preach. Revelation is not to scare you. It's Revelation to prepare you. To prepare you to be right with God. To prepare you to not say, oh, I have tomorrow. To prepare you that today is the day of salvation, as Jesus said. Amen? You need to be ready for God. Be ready for Him. But to wake up and receive salvation. Therefore, He will do whatever it takes in their families in the financial situations, in their health, in their marriages, to get them on their knees. And as I told you, the Lord, you know, I, I almost died in March. And, uh, and you know, people say, and I, my Pentecostal friends say, oh, the devil, the devil was getting you, the devil. And it might have been the devil. But how many know God works even the devil for his will? And I saw more of God in it than I saw the devil in it. And God woke me up, and basically the, the lesson I learned is that God said, you compare yourself with other pastors, you compare yourself with other leaders, and you think, man, I'm doing so good. And God said to me, Craig, I, I was ready to die, and, and I told you the guy said, do you want to be resuscitated, Craig? And I said, no. And my wife goes, yes, you do. I'm like, okay. You're like, you know, and I was just like, because I was just tired. I hadn't slept for three days. But you know what the Lord said to me? He goes, Craig, if you had died, you wouldn't have had the reception you thought you would have had. Now, it wasn't that I wouldn't go to heaven. It just wasn't like I was thinking I was all that. And God says, I do not grade on a curve. You have not been living the life I've asked you to live. And not that I was in sin. It, wasn't, it was just, I was just kind of coasting. Press it hard, coast, press hard, coast. And God's saying, you just got to go all out for me for you. You know, I mean, what you know to do. Right? What the Bible says, what a man knows to do is not do it. It's sin to that man. And the Lord says, you got to put it. And so I was like, I mean, I was shocked. I was like, wow, thank you, because I thought I was all that. So you go, really? Hmm. You know, but I mean, uh, you know, and the Lord kind of, but how many, a lot of us think that? How many friends you know that think they're Christian, yet they're living like the devil? And you're like, you ain't going to have the reception you think. You might hear depart from me. I never knew you, right? And so we want that. How many of God loves us enough to give us that wake-up call before it's too late? Because once you're dead, there's no makeup. You don't get to go, okay, give me another chance. No, it's it, one life, okay? So therefore, he, 
He will do whatever it takes, they said, to wake us up. But here's the question. What kind of locusts will God have to allow in our lives in our, as Christians and as the church to wake us up from our lethargy, to wake us up from our drowsiness, to wake us up from our great apathy? But whatever it takes, he loves us enough to let it happen. I love what probably my favorite pastor, Pastor John Corson, some of you had him as a pastor, but he says it this way. I like it. He says, he says, Christianity, if you're a true Christian, if you really know Jesus, it's rubber band theology. And I'm like, what, what does that mean? That's weird. And he goes, rubber band theology. He goes, here it is. So here's Christ, and here's you, and you can pull away. You can live for self. You can do all kinds of stuff. You can party. You can mess around sexually. But he says, if you do that, here's what happens. You pull away, and the rubber band, you go, you smack back. So, so you decide how hard do you want to smack. You know, you go far away, smack harder, right? So I think it's just best to stay close, right? Don't stretch that rubber band because if you're God's, right, he says he disciplines those he loves like a father disciplines his favorite son. Amen? If your parent doesn't discipline you or spank you, guess what? You ain't that loved. But if your parents, my kids know, they were loved. They're button, bam. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, because right, I wanted to warn them. And I told you Cannon, I remember spanking Cannon once. He's like, and I remember just going, Cannon, do you know why I did that? And he goes, because you're a jerk. No, he didn't say that. No, he says, the reason you did that, Dad, is because you love me and you want me to know that there's a consequence for doing wrong. Wow. There you go. But I wish nobody, nobody disciplined me. But guess what? A police officer had to discipline me once with a nightstick. That wasn't real fun. Trust me. I would rather get a spank on my butt than get hit in the head with a nightstick. Trust me. But... You know, and I always say that. I love what Dobson said. If you don't discipline your children, then a cop will have to do it for you. That's right. A lot of times. Middle of verse 14. Who are bound at the great Euphrates River. Verse 15. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released. They were released to kill, hear this, a third of mankind. When the demons that reside in the Euphrates are loosed, they will kill one-third of humanity. Hear that, one-third. Added to the number of those already killed in this chapter is now, theologians believe, 50% of the earth is dead. That's a lot of death. What, that's three and a half billion people? We're at seven billion now? Are we seven billion? Three and a half billion people are dead. And how will this take place? Well, let's read on. Verse 16. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. Hear this. When John wrote this in 80, I believe, 96, there wasn't even 200 million people on the earth. How many know that, you know, not even 200 million on the earth? Now, China, I guess, in 1965 said they could produce in about six months a 200 million man army. So it's probably even more now. They have more people. But 1965, they bragged that they could have a 200 million man army. Verse, uh, and I heard the number of them. Verse 17, and thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had the breastplate of fiery red and high, hyacinth. That's dark blue. <laughs> I can't say it right. But hyacinth is, is dark blue. And sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouth came fire, smoke, brimstone. Verse 18, by these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone, which came out of their mouths. Verse 19, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails, and their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. So who is this army? John's readers must have thought, oh no, oh no, it's the Romans. They're going to march against us once again. And indeed they would. Yet read carefully now that there's good reason to agree with some commentators who say that this is John's attempt to describe guns, to describe tanks, to describe personnel carriers for troops and missile launchers as a description of of what we know today as modern weaponry. Some people say that. I'm not quite sure about that, but some people say it. It's possible. But because of this army is set in motion by four fallen angels of verse 15, it is comprised of much more, hear this, than military generals 
or political coalitions, from John's heavenly vantage point, he sees how the, hear this, how the demonic realm directly affects the nations. Amen? Amen? The demonic realms. We wrestle not against principalities and powers. We don't wrestle against the liberals. But how many know it's principalities and powers that we're fighting against? That's what controls the hearts and minds of men. It's demonic. You either control, right? Remember Bob Dylan? He used to say, you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil. It may be the... Nobody likes... Sorry. I thought I was trying. But remember he said that? You got to serve. It might be the devil. It might be the devil. You don't only have two choices. And now you think people say, well, but what about myself? Yourself is the devil. I was listening to Reverend Zacharias the other day, and he was saying the greatest sin started in the garden when Satan said, hey, if you eat from this tree and knowledge of good and evil, you'll be like God. And guess what? Whenever you live for self and you want to be the God of your life, guess whose kingdom you're in? The kingdom of Satan. Amen? So there's only two people you can serve, Jesus or Satan. But I'm serving myself, Satan. Right? Directly affects the nations. These demons are stinging. And the armies are marching, and Jesus is interceding for the people on the earth to repent. So what's the response of these people? You'd think this would wake most people up, right? Isn't it amazing? I, I want to say this too. i got to say this. this is, we're going to see this later uh, in the book of Revelation. But it's so amazing to me how people will tell you, if only we have a utopian society where everyone has free college, everyone has freedom, everyone's equal, then everyone will be a good person. Don't they say that? But here's what's wild. In the thousand-year reign of Christ, so after the tribulation, Jesus comes back. People are, everyone who's in the thousand-year reign will be saved, right? We'll come back, and those who are the tribulation saints will all be on the earth and will be saved. But then, a thousand years, those people are going to have, they're going to be like us. They have a sinful nature still. That's where we're going to rule and reign, kind of keep them corralled in. But in that thousand years, they're going to have kids. And those kids are going to need to receive Christ themselves, but those kids, some of those kids are not going to receive Christ. Isn't that amazing? With Jesus ruling and reigning, perfection, no sin, you can play with a rattlesnake, no trouble. But those people, once they, at the end of a thousand years, Satan's going to be released to tempt them, and some are going to turn to Satan again. If you're not sure that we're dumb as people and we're sheep, wow, how could we do that? So don't believe the life we had. If everyone had equal college, everyone had equal this, if everyone lived in equal housing, everyone would be a nice person. No, they wouldn't. Some people are evil. And I don't know why. What makes one person turn to God? What makes one person, their mom dies, they turn to God. One person, their mom dies, they hate and want to kill everyone at the mall. I don't know. Well, I know it's the enemy, but why does one person give in to it or one person yield themselves to Christ? I don't understand it. And we never will. Who knows the heart of man except man and really God? Does that make sense to you guys? It's just kind of crazy to me. But anyways, that's free. Verse 20. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by those plagues, hear this, did not repent of the works of their hands, and they should not worship demons. Hear this, the mark of the beast. I heard someone say it, Jack Hibbs, a Calvary pastor, said this. People are so afraid with a chip, you know, for, for, for like getting a chip in their hand for money and all that. He says, no, this is not talking just about a chip in your forehead or your hand. This is making an alliance with Satan. This is worship. This isn't just convenience where, oops, I got it. Oh, no, I'm lost. No, this is called you make a pledge to the beast. Do you get it? So it's not just convenience. You're going to actually make a, a commitment to worship the devil and demons. And the eye says, and they not worship the demons, that they should not worship demons and the idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Well, some of you might be saying, well, Craig, why do you read this to us? This, this doesn't apply to us today. We don't have idols of bronze, metal, or gold. Have you looked in your garage lately? Some of, you, some of your husbands are watching, my precious, right? And just rubbing their car, right? Or their motorcycle, right? I mean, you know, come on. You know, yeah, we don't worship metal, right? <laughs> yeah, ours just has more chrome than gold on it, right? But, uh, and then, you know, some people say, well, you know, Craig, I don't, I don't have idols, definitely have wood. How's your house doing? I can tell you, 
I can't tell you how many people have said, oh, I say, hey, where you been? I haven't seen you in a while. Oh, I've been remodeling my bathroom. Yeah. Now think about that. Jesus was to be what? Number one in your life? Yeah. And you can't sacrifice two hours on your weekend for Jesus. He's number one. And you're going to tell me your house is not your idol? I said that to someone and they got very angry. But how many know? You know, sometimes, like you say, if you throw a rock in a pack of dogs, the one that yelps is the one that got hit. Someone's got to love you enough to say the truth. And we still have idols. We just hide it. We don't have like little Buddhas, but we have idols, cars, houses, finances, jobs, people. So don't get uppity like we're, we're above that. No, we're not. Verse 21, and they did not repent of their murders. Now you might say, well, I've never murdered anyone. Well, how many know for us as Christians, how many know just being angry with your brother, that's murder? That's, right. that's how holy God is. So all of us have murdered one time or another, probably most of us. Maybe my wife not, but all of us else have. I have murdered many people with anger. But hear this, since abortion was legalized in America in 1973, they have now been more than 60 million babies aborted. Six, and it's still growing every day. Millions, 60 million. That's, that's a low estimate. Murdered on our soil more than all this. Here are the, all the wars combined. I want to park on this for a second. Isn't it amazing that the same people who say war is evil, Trump's a warmonger, this is terrible, war is evil, are the same people who say, hey, it's all right to take a baby out of a mother's womb make it comfortable, and then take a knife and scramble its brains. How does that work? How do you not see that that's a life, just as much as someone who's 20 or you know, going to war 18 years old? How, is that, how does that compute? And here's the thing I love to say to my liberal family when they say to this, do you remember the National Organization of Women? Remember they, they said now, National Organization of Women said that they, wanted, they were pushing abortion, and they said abortion is just a fetus. You're, just, you're not killing a baby, you're just killing a fetus, 1973. But then in Beijing, I think Beijing's changed now, but Beijing used to do where they would uh, do a sonogram. If they saw it was a girl, then they would abort it because they want to have a boy because a boy will take care of them, and so they all want a boy. But then the National Organization of Women said that you're discriminating against women. And I remember saying to my liberal aunt, I go, so is it something about the international dateline that the fetus becomes a woman? Do you get it? Yeah. How does that work? It was a fetus here, but in Beijing, it's a woman being discriminated against. Then another thing I say to them, I love to, I love to get my family all roughed up. And it's funny, they've got master's degrees, one's got a doctorate, and yet they can't answer doofy me. I'm like, school me, I'm dumb, <laughs> I'm dumb you know? And they go, you're too beyond hope. But I said this, I said, okay, explain this to me, because they say it's a woman's choice, right? A woman's choice. Don't touch my body. It's my choice. Yeah. Isn't this wild how that woman who's driving, if somebody hits her and she lives but it kills her baby, what, what are they charged with? Vehicular manslaughter. But if that woman's driving to an abortion clinic, she has the right to kill that baby. Now hear me. When someone says a woman's choice, so here's what you're really saying. You give a woman the choice to determine value. That's just a fetus or it's a precious baby. That's a lot of power, isn't it? That's playing God. Because who formed us in our mother's womb? The mom? No, God. So guess what? And hear this. I want to say this. I'm going to park on this. And some of you go, <laughs> whatever. Go to a liberal church. But here it is. Here it is, too. They say, they'll say, uh, oh, no, I lost my plane. I saw some one of your faces. You know, but anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> what was I going to say? <laughs> oh, the liberals said this in 1973. If you allow abortion, then every child that will be a wanted child and child abuse will go down. Since 1973, child abuse has gone up 420%. Because the feeling is, if I can take you out in the womb, why can't I take you out when you're three or four years old when you're driving me crazy? Do you see what happens? We as Christians, we as people need to value human life, that everyone is created in the image of God. Amen? Amen? Yeah, give the Lord a clap. And you need to vote for people 
who believe in the sanctity of life. And if you don't, guess what? Hear this. Ezekiel 33.3 says, if you see the enemy coming, you do not warn the people, their blood is upon your head. But if you warn the people, their blood will be upon their own head. We need to do our part to vote for people who believe in the sanctity of human life. Amen? That's all I'm going to say now. I think I've angered most of you. All right, there we go. Now, hopefully none of you. Middle of verse 21. And they would not repent of their sorceries or witchcraft, other versions say. The word translated sorceries or witchcraft here is the word pharmakia in the Greek, from which we get our word pharmacy, and that's found in Galatians 5, uh, 19 through 20, where it says sorcery. That's the word pharmakia there. So now, hear this, we begin to see the access point into individuals' lives, a peep into people's lives, into generation, into a nation. When pe- persons smoke, like simple people say, smoke marijuana. It doesn't hurt anyone. Uh, yes, it does. Because it opens you up. I won't ask you to raise your hands because I know you won't. But I used to smoke marijuana. A lot of marijuana. Some of you go, I can tell. No, but I mean, I used to. And if you've smoked marijuana, you know the first time you did, you get paranoid when you get high. You get a paranoid. Why do you think you get paranoid? People say, oh, it's just a chemical reaction. No, I believe it's because it's demonic. Because it if you'll see biblically, the word pharmakia and the word sorcery are one. So drugs welcome you, welcome the enemy into your life. So people say, oh, I just smoked marijuana. I, I can tell you a story. I'm just going to say this here. We have a couple women in this church whose husbands say they're Christian and smoke marijuana. Both those husbands have been physically violent to them. Now, I thought marijuana is supposed to make you mellow, right? What's up, dude? Why would it do that? Because as a Christian, supposed a Christian, you're welcoming the demonic in your life. When I was flirting with Jesus, when, when Dan Hicks shared Christ with me, and I said, oh, I love Jesus as Savior, but I wasn't ready to surrender to him as Lordship. And I believe for me, and you can argue with me, but you can be wrong, but is, that was a joke, but, but hear this, I received Jesus as Savior, which is 80% of America, but it wasn't until I made him Lord and surrendered all that I really knew that I knew that I was saved. When the Bible says, his spirit bears witness of my spirit that I'm a child of God. And some of you here are not sure you're saved because, in my opinion, you haven't really made him Lord. But when I said, okay, God, everything's in your basket. No more, no more back. I don't have an exit strategy. It's you or bust. Then I knew I was saved. I knew it. I knew God. God came into my life and changed my life. But hear this. Hear this. When I, so I heard about Jesus, and I, was, and I really liked Jesus, but I didn't want to make him Lord yet because my life was too good. I would smoke marijuana and I'd take LSD. And I'd be on the beaches in Oregon, and all of a sudden my friends would watch me, and it'd be a stormy night, and all of a sudden they would say that I would be getting thrown through the air, and I was fighting somebody. And I'd wake up with big, huge bruises all over me. And they said, no one hit me. I said, you guys didn't hit me? No one hit me. What I think, and you might think I'm crazy, but I think that was demonic spirits trying to kill me. And I want to tell you this, I had a lot of demonic oppression when I got saved, and I never once worshipped the devil. I never once was into Satanism. But I believe how I opened myself up was through hallucinogenic drugs. So when people say, oh, marijuana doesn't hurt anyone, bull knee. I smoked so much marijuana that if I didn't smoke marijuana, I felt high when I wasn't high. Now tell me we need that in our society. So don't let anyone tell you about that. You know, don't let anyone, and now I suppose we, the, what is the good part of marijuana that helps you with stuff? The what? What the what? CBD. You can have the CBD, whatever oil, and not have to get high, right? Most of it, I don't know. Anyway, I better shut up. Anyway, <laughs> but a lot of the people that have the marijuana things are fat old guys like me that want to live the old days of hippiness, right? You know, it's goofy. Anyway, you got a little quiet there. He scared me. But anyway. Oh, here. But this is the access point to an individual, people, a generation. And hear this also when we get drunk with alcohol, right? The Bible says in, uh, in uh, Ephesians 5.18, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why would he say that? Because you open yourself. How many, how many people have gotten drunk and said, oh, I can't believe what I did? Why? 
because probably because you, you, your inhibitions are gone, but also the enemy's there to say, hey, go for it. You know why I think the enemy loves drugs? Because that way you don't know it's really him. You think it's just me being nuts. And he likes that because it's sort of, you, you don't know it's him. Amen? And so we need to be careful. Or people who use crystal meth. I heard this, a lot of times the people, why they kill people on, on crack and crystal meth is not so much a drug as a sleep deprivation. That's what made me crazy. I'd be up for four days straight and I would want, you know how, you ever fall asleep and you kind of go like that and you wake up, kind of jolt? It's like I would walk around in the jolt. And if someone said, rotors, I'd be like, I'm just going to go, and I want to kill them. Think about all the hippies that used to shout, I am Jesus Christ, I am God, when they were dropping acid. Because drugs and the demonic go hand in hand. The world thinks drugs just messes with your mind. But I'm here to tell you biblically that it's much more than that. It affects your very soul and it opens you up to the demonic. Look up that word. Pharmakia, sorcery, is one. Drugs and pharmakia. And that's why a lot of the Eastern religions have drugs with it. Peyote, because it opens you, because of the hallucinogenic. It says, uh, middle of verse uh, 21, they would not repent of their sexual immorality. I'm hitting it all. We've hit giving. We've hit uh, get down. Now we're hitting sexuality. This should hit some people. <laughs> this is why many of your friends and coworkers are going through their own tribulation right now. Oh, but they'll say, but I haven't hurt anyone. They'll say, and I will say to you, wrong. There's a demonic component to fornication. More than half of all babies in the U.S. are born out of wedlock. I was one of them. And guess what, guys? I had this guy who got angry last week called me a wannabe drug dealer tough guy. Now we know that was 38 years ago. I am a wannabe tough guy. I am a doughboy. But if you'd seen me 38 years ago, I promise you, you wouldn't have been happy to meet me in a parking lot. Unless you're really tough. But I was a mean guy. Why was I a mean guy? Because I didn't have a father. Why was I a mean guy? Because my mom died when I was eight or six. Why was I a mean guy? Because I was bounced around from my grandmother in New York, my, my aunt in, in Oregon, my grandpa in Wyoming. And I was bounced around. I, was, so I, I didn't stay in one school. Uh, I didn't finish a one school year till I was a freshman in high school. And the only reason I did that was because I told my aunt, if you don't let me stay, I'm going to run away. But I was an angry, angry young man. And I felt like, you know, and they say that this generation, a fatherless generation, that it makes young men very, very angry. And I was full of rage. And I felt like the world messed, you know, screwed me. And I felt I can screw the world. Everyone owes me. Sound like any kids you know today? And so when people say, oh, it doesn't hurt anyone. Yes, it does. When God, hear this, when God says don't do something, it isn't to kill your joy. It's bad because he says it's bad because it's bad. Not because he said it bad. It's not because it's bad. what do they like to do? That's bad. No, he's not a killjoy. He's saying it's bad because it hurts you. It hurts people. I'm living proof of that. God's healed me, but I'm living proof of that. Then pornography. Good thing no one struggles with that here. Only the first service, I think, does. Pornography and adultery, that puts a hook into one's soul. I can't begin to tell you how many marriages have been broken up even in this church because of these sins and how demonic it is. I, I knew this woman who came to me and said, my husband's looking at pornography. Not just looking, he's blatantly doing it in front of me. And then she, she started, then she, here it is. So then she started allowing him because she goes, what can I do? Well, you could say you need to stop. Either you go or I go, but we ain't going to live like this. But guess what? She found herself all of a sudden starting to want to look at pornography. Do you know this? Men are turned on by sight. The, I forget the statistic of men. It's like, what is it, 70%? It's 70% of men struggle with pornography, maybe 80. But women used to be really low. It only used to be like 10%. Now it's going up. It's like 20 to 25%. Women are, and women aren't as turned on visually. Well, they're becoming more so, but that's how much lost. But this woman, all of a sudden, she's looking at pornography. Do you see if you allow that spirit in your house? And then you know what? Let me just show you. I want to scare you guys. Can I scare you? So then she allowed that. Then she was doing it. All of a sudden, they're taking care of their grandchild. And all of a sudden, he sees her touching his granddaughter inappropriately. 
How many know, guys, you can't contain lust? Lust wants more and more and more and more. So don't flirt with lust because lust will destroy you, destroy your family, and destroy your children. And you don't want to pass that on to your kids, especially men. Got kind of quiet there. You guys are worried about the first service, right? <laughs> first Corinthians six eighteen says this. I want to read it. it. Says, "Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does." Do you hear that? Nothing affects you like sexual sin. Nothing will make you affect you more or make you more guilty. For sexual morality is a sin against your own body. You take it serious. End of verse 21. And they would not repent of their thefts. Now some of you might be saying, oh, Pastor Craig, well, good. This definitely doesn't apply to me. I'm a good Christian. You know, it doesn't apply to us at CCV. You know, I, I don't steal. Okay, let's read. Malachi 3.7. I want you guys to love me. I, I've been on vacation. I felt too good about myself. I need rejection, okay? <laughs> Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Verse 8, will a man rob God? And yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Let me explain something to you real quick. I don't look what anyone gives because I don't want to hate you guys. (laughs) I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. And I don't want to love some of you guys more than others. I don't look, I don't look. But I've been told some of you write tithe in the memo of your check. And give 20 bucks. How many know that's probably not a tithe? And, and hear this. I want to just say this real quick. And I'm trying to say it fast. Ananias and Sapphira, remember what happened to them? They got killed by God because of Peter. Because what? Because they lied about that they sold a piece of property and they said they gave all the money to God. They didn't have to. It was an offering. They didn't have to. But they lied. And Peter said, did you really give all? And he says, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? And he died. They died. And then his wife came in and she died. Hear this. If you say tithe, that means, here's what it means. 10% of your gross income. That means you make $100, you give $10. You make $1,000, you give $100. That's what a tithe means. So some of you are giving oneies. Call it a tithe can you smile or is it, you guys? It's your fault, honey. You did it. No. Okay? Some of you have given a halfy, you know, not even a one But hear this if you write tithe, if you want to tithe, that means 10%. Amen. And hear this, guys. I want to just say this. I'll park here for a moment, too. Is they say the, the church in America has, brings in $3 billion. But they said, that sounds like a lot. It really isn't. Hear this. They said if everyone who calls himself an evangelical Christian tithed, they would bring in $73 billion. Now, some of us go, but yeah, Kenneth Copeland would get a new Learjet. That's not right. But how many know we're not, I don't have Learjet, I promise. I know I dress really sharp. I spend a lot of money on clothes. But hear this, we're to give to the Lord, as Kevin said. Think of that. We're missing $70 billion. What could happen to the Church of America, godly churches, if they had those resources? And we have to struggle just to try to give raises. But wouldn't it be wild if we go, man, guys, stop giving. Remember Moses when he said give to the temple? He said, stop giving. Enough. (laughs) Now, would a pastor do that? I don't know today. But wouldn't that be neat if we go, man, I got so much, we got so much money here, I don't know what to do with it. We don't have that problem. Trust me. We haven't raised our budget. Before we came here, we hadn't raised our budget in like 13 years. And we came here, we haven't raised our budget in four years. And you know everything's going down, right? I haven't had a raise in 13 years. Figure that out. Okay? 
So hear this. Kevin hasn't raised in forever. Here it is. And you've robbed me in tithes and offerings. Verse 9. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Remember, Nate, America used to be considered very blessed. Other nations wanted to be like America. Remember? And why? Here's why. Because Kraft Cheese. Ever heard of them? They used to tithe. I don't know if they do anymore, but they used to. The owner tithe. Ivory soap? Tithe. Uh, uh, J.C. Penny? Tithe. Maybe they would be still around if they did tithe. You know, all these Colgate used to tithe. Secular companies used to cur jars. I used to tell all this stuff. Cur jars. Her husband died. She freaked out. Oh, what do I do? And she said, uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a reverse tithe. Here's what I want, God. This is all I need to do to live on. And everything else you make, I'll give to, to World Mission. I'll give to the church. You ever heard of cur jars? Yes. They're around because they do that. That's what the blessing. I'll never forget the story. I'll tell you this about Ivory Soap. This, this, he was on a, a riverboat. He was with his captain. He ran away from home. His parents sent him away. And he says, my boy, this is the starter of ivory soap. If you want to be successful in life, you tithe. You make 10 cents, you give one penny to God. You will be successful in whatever you do. Do you hear the story about the ivory soap? Did you hear how it went? He was working for a soap company. He let it go too long. It lathered too much. And he made the soap by accident. Ivory soap, the soap that floats. Could that have been God? <laughs> Figure it out. Anyway, verse 10. Bring all the tithes, not the oney, all the tithes into the storehouse that there are many, there may be food in my house. Now hear this. Some of you are going, but Craig, this is Old Testament. Okay, then never claim of no Testament promise ever again. <laughs> and some of you go, tithing is not in the New Testament. Yes, it is. Matthew 23, 22. 23, 23, it says, Jesus says, of course you should tithe. But also remember justice, mercy, and love. So, nice try. Anyway, <laughs> he says this, that there may be food in my house, and he says, try me or test me. Do you realize this is the only place in the whole Bible, 66 books, where God says, test me. Isn't that my, you know what I've said in this pulpit, and I'll say it again. I said, if you tithe out of love, don't tithe to get but if you go, God, you're so good to me and I want to give to you and trust you, because that's really what it is, is trust, isn't it? Because you go, this is my money. I worked hard for it. Nobody, Craig, Pastor Craig, he's too fat. He'll eat it. I know it. No, you give to the Lord. You trust him. And guess what happens? You're blessed. I said this and I'll say it again. I'll say it, you ch try me on this, but you better mark it. You give by check or you give online. And if you tithe, try for three months. And if God doesn't bless you, then I'll give you your money back. But I know God will bless you. Amen. Can I just get a raise of hand? How many have been blessed by tithing? Don't brag about tithing. Look, there you go. More than half this congregation. Now, people have left this church because I talk about this. I don't care. Because I'm not doing this to get a Learjet. I'm doing this so that you will be blessed because you'll have the favor of God on your life and on your finances. And I care more about you than I care about you liking me. Some of you go, yeah, I see it. Amen. <laughs> but he says, try me, test me, and, and, and know in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out such blessing, there will be not enough room to receive it or contain it. How many would like to have that problem? Lord, whoa, whoa my bank. I got to get another bank account. This is amazing. But I love what one man of God, Spurgeon, said this. He goes, you, he goes, God can do more with your 90 than you can do with a full 100%. You need to trust God. And that's really what it is. Isn't God need your money? He needs, without faith, it's impossible to God. That's what it is. And I love what Spurgeon said. He said, giving is one of the last things of our flesh. Right? You can give, you can give your time. You can give it, but when it's you, your money, you're like, <laughs> and then you start being critical. Craig, is Craig gaining weight? He's eating my tithe, isn't he? I know that. When you give, you're giving to the Lord. Now hear this. If you know a ministry is misusing money, then don't give. Then take, go to a church where you can give. But don't say, oh, they, all those pastors are scammers. Don't do it. Because you're giving unto the Lord. And what did Jesus say? Where your treasures will be your heart also. Amen. Don't store up treasures on earth, but store up treasures in heaven. Do you realize people say you can't send, take it with you? You can't, but you can t send it on ahead. And you do it by giving in love. Amen. Amen. 
And then he says this, there will be not enough room to receive it. And verse 11, he says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Isn't this awesome? He means your tires will run longer, will last longer than they're supposed to. Your car will last longer. Your roof will last longer. Your AC will last longer. Your teeth will last longer. Your car will last so long you'll wish it didn't. You'll go, honey, I want a new car. This thing won't break, you know. But it'll, because he'll rebuke the devourer. He'll rebuke as what the second law of thermodynamics in Arizona. Have you seen it? Everything tends towards the K, right? You see your paint on your house? Oh, I just painted it last year, it seems like, right? Is that all right? You guys still love me? Some of you are like, no. We try to keep this church at a manageable size. You really try. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that's why so many Christians are experiencing tribulation financially today. And think about it. Christians are supposed to be what? You're supposed to be the head and not the tail. You're supposed to lend, not borrow. So many Christians are in debt. You should be blessed to be a blessing. Doing any one of these things is giving Satan, hear this, access into your life and then to your family's life. Now you might be saying, Pastor Craig, I'm confused. I thought that, 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 that you taught that demons can't possess a believer. A lot of Calvary people, do believe they don't believe you can be demonically oppressed. But I'm here to tell you that I was demonically oppressed as a Christian, and it's hard to argue with it when you've been delivered as a Christian. But hear this. A Christian cannot be possessed. You'll never see a demon-possessed believer in Scripture. You don't. 1 John 4, 4 says, He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. For a believer, there's no such thing as demon possession. But hear this. There is such thing called demon oppression. That's like a monkey on your back. That's like, think of it like a, a leech on you. Now, now think about this. You're not sure about this, and I don't have my notes. Sorry, people. But think about this. Ephesians 4.27 says what? Do not, it says, do not give into anger, which what? Gives the devil a mighty foothold. He's talking to the Ephesian believers. How can you give the devil a foothold if you can't have oppression as a believer? Ask my wife. I still sometimes struggle with anger. And when I've been really angry, my wife goes, who are you? You know? Because the enemy tries to come in. And so we need to realize that. And so we need to be careful of that. For a believer, as I said, there's no such thing. But hear this. Your family, your life will be oppressed continually if you allow demons these entry points. Any one of these entry points. Either through drugs or alcohol, pornography, or robbing from God. Why do you think the devil tries so hard to get Christians to struggle with these things? Because Satan knows he can't steal your salvation, but he wants to rob you of having life and life more abundantly. Can we agree that a lot of Christians aren't living an abundant life? Today, the Holy Spirit, I believe, is speaking to some of you, saying you're being stung badly. Even as a Christian, or especially as a non-Christian. So you might be saying, but pastor, what can I do? Well, you need to repent. Repent. And you repent and turn from what you're doing. And let me explain real quick what repentance means. A lot of times we just say, oh, I, I feel bad. That's not repentance. Repentance first means to agree with God, right? It means you say, God, I'm going, I'm going this way, the wrong way, and now I need to go this way. So you agree first in your head. But then repentance means you don't just go, yeah, I feel so terrible. I shouldn't fornicate, but I'm going to. No, it means you ch- do about face. It's also a military term. That means you do a 180. Morgan had a person in his classroom that said, I've totally repented, I've done a 360. And Morgan goes, doesn't that mean you're right back? <laughs> <You know? laughs> we want to do a 180. You're going the wrong way, and then you turn around and you go the right way. <laughs> Amen? That's what repentance means. And you know, don't some of you know that? You go, oh, I'm so sorry, God, I'm so sorry. But you know you're going to do it right away? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we got to take precautions, right? Did you ever see, remember Fireproof? Remember the movie Fireproof? Remember he, his wife was saying, don't think I don't know what you do on that computer. Remember that? And then what happened? He's bashing his computer, smashing it. And remember the neighbor's like, honey, do not hang around that boy. <laughs> but then remember he said, I thought it was so cool. I'm not a woman, but I thought, I was like, this is so precious. Right? He says, he put a rose there and he wrote a card, I love you more. Amen. How many women would like to hear that? I'm making friends wherever I go, aren't I? (laughs) 
or have done any one of these things, and if you listen to the Holy Spirit's voice and submit your will to His, then the stings of the devil will start to flee. What does it say in James 4, 7? Let's read that, James 4, 7. Submit yourselves then to God. So that means coming under His authority. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he what? will flee from you. Verse 8, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Hear this, this is the part of repentance. Cleanse your hands. Don't just feel bad. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. You know what that means? It means you kind of have one foot in the world, one foot in the church, one foot with Christ, and you're, un- you're unstable. It says you're like a wave tossed in the sea. you got to pick a team and get on it. Amen. Jesus said you're either for me or you're against me. Either sow with me or you scatter. If you have a struggling with a sin, you got to be radical. What did Jesus say? How radical is your Lord? If your right eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your right leg, calls, if your foot, stumble, chop it off. Now you go, whoa, Jesus. He's saying do whatever it takes. Why? Because it says it's terrible to enter heaven, hell perfectly. It'd be better to enter heaven maimed than to go to hell with a perfect body. And what he's saying is, don't get the idea of cutting things off. I'm not saying that. But he's saying, if you need to smash your computer, smash it. If you need to put special software on, put it on. Do whatever it takes so that you'll be pure and you don't give a place to the devil in your life. Amen? Amen. So he'll flee from your life and from your family's life. And Jesus will restore to you what the locust of sin has stolen. Amen? I want you guys to be free. I want to be free. I'll tell you one thing. When my wife and I got married, she came from a highly dysfunctional family. I came from an even more dysfunctional family. And what I prayed before, when I asked her to marry me, I said to her, I said, I pray that all the sins of my family die with me. And I pray that all the sins of her family die with her and that we don't pass it on. Because I'll tell you, there's nothing sadder than to see your sins be passed on to your children. And I hope you, like me, don't want to pass on things where you're going, and where your wife's going, he's just like you. <laughs> I want to leave a good legacy of someone who was deeply into sin, was deeply demonized, but repented and turned to God. Amen? Because Jesus is here. And hear this, guys. He's not just here to forgive you. He's here to restore back what the locusts have stolen. But you have to take God seriously. Hear this, guys. If you want God to move radically in your life, then you need to move radically for him. If you do it half-heartedly, expect a half-hearted return. But if you say, God, everything, I'm putting everything in your basket, then guess what? He's going to move powerfully in your life. Amen? Amen? Amen. Can someone get the lights, please? Jesus said, I've come that you might have life. Worship team, you can come. That you might have life and life more abundantly. Some of you, if you're honest, you struggle with drugs. Maybe it's not marijuana or crack, but maybe it's prescription drugs. Some of you maybe struggle with drunkenness. You know, getting, getting buzzed a lot. A lot of you probably struggle with pornography. Most men have. And then also... Some of you today need to repent of robbing God. And then lastly, idolatry. Putting anything before God, our homes, our jobs, our career, our pleasures. If we want to see God move powerfully in our lives, we need to make Him Lord. Amen? Amen. And I pray that this message does not condemn you, but I pray it exhorted you to surrender. And I pray that today I, I would call, if you want Some of you maybe during the worship song need to come to the altar and bow down and just surrender that area or areas to God. And maybe it's not one of these areas, but you know there's an area God's asking for and you've been just holding back. And if you were honest, you'd say, Pastor Craig, I don't experience the power of Jesus. I don't don't see that resurrection power. Hear this. God spoke this to me this morning. Hear this, guys. All of us want to live, right? But hear this. If you want to live in Christ, what did Jesus say? He who tries to gain his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will what? Gain it. If you want the resurrection power of Jesus, guess what has to happen? You've got to die. Die to self. Die to self-rule. Die to self-will. Die to those sins. 
And if you'll come and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm tired of running my life. I'm tired of doing, trying to be the Lord of my life. I give my life to you. You be the Lord. And God promises the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead will resurrect your immortal body. It will give you the power to say no to drugs, to say no to alcohol, to say no to sexual morality, to say no to whatever sin is, is you're struggling with. I told you the story that when I fully made Jesus Lord, I was delivered instantly from drugs, instantly from alcohol, instantly from sexual morality, being a womanizer. Because why? I was sick of my life without Jesus. I was sick of this world, and I didn't believe it had anything good anymore to offer me. We need to get to that place, amen? Jesus or bust. No other way but Jesus. As we play this worship song, if that's you, feel free to come. I know some of you might be embarrassing, but come to the altar. Get right with God. And if not, then go away today. Get alone and give that thing to God. Tell your wife, tell your spouse, I'm struggling. Or tell, as a family, we're struggling with this and we need to stop this. Some of you might be watching bad movies. Whatever that thing is or things, get it right. So that you, I love what A.W. Tozer said. He said, the man or woman of God is like going down a tunnel towards God and he's blocking, he's boarding up all the exits from God, amen? You need to allow God today to board up those exits so all you have is Jesus. And when all you have is Jesus, you have everything, amen? Bless you, amen. You may stand, let's worship the Lord. Two creatures of a God and King Lift up your voice and let the sea Oh, praise Russia.